Good morning. Ah, there we go. Is this working? Can you hear it? Okay. So it's really good to be here in Budapest and to be uh, able to speak with you. But since I'm in this talk um, advertisement mode, I'll start with a little advertisement for my talk. Um, it says it's about scaling and about the dilemma with scaling, but I promise that it will be controversial. So there we go. Um, all the time I think about scaling, I wonder what people are scaling. What, what does it mean to scale? There's a couple of different ways that I've heard it spoken of. There's this thing called Scaled Agile Framework, which we'll get to. And then there's the, we're a nice small business, startup business, something like that, and then we get big. So we'll start with that concept of scaling. Uh, here's how we started out. And in the beginning, everybody worked together, and we put together an awesome piece of music business, yes. And it was really wonderful. And then uh, we were successful. And when success happens, we get big. And we have all of these different uh, groups of people all over doing different kinds of things. And suddenly, we're not so fast. We're not so awesome anymore. We are kind of just satisfactory. So what is the problem that we're solving when we're thinking about scaling? That's the questions that I want to talk about. And I'm going to propose a couple. One is we're solving a cooperation problem. We're solving a mindset problem, not, not your kind of mindset, but a different kind of mindset. That's where I get nice and controversial. Um, and then a focus problem and a complexity problem. So let's start out with this concept of cooperation. So when companies grow up, they tend to create these things called cylinders of excellence. There's the engineering excellence and the marketing excellence and the finance excellence. And of course, we call them silos. They're these nice, beautiful cylinders. If, if you happen to be in Wisconsin, which is a state right next to me, and you drive, that's what you see all over. These would be mostly containing corn silage for the cows. And um, so cylinders of excellence or silos are generally in a company when it first starts to grow, we get competency silos. So we get the people in one silo with a certain competency and a different silo with a certain competency. And um, suddenly, the thing we're trying to do, which has to go across all of these silos, has a hard time getting done. And so, and you've heard this, okay, you've heard this here, we have to change and create these cross-functional teams or cross-silo teams, right? So what we do then is we just put the silos on the side. Does that sound familiar? So we have all these um, autonomous teams, and they're all sort of independently doing their own thing. And we haven't actually solved the scaling problem when all of a sudden we have all sorts of independent autonomous teams doing whatever they want to do. Now, some companies can work that way. I hear Amazon does OK. Um, but generally speaking, we have just as much trouble with scaling when we have cross-functional teams because we're good at solving problems within our small-ish group. Um, this number, seven, plus or minus two, good team size, right? You've heard of it? Where does it come from? It comes from research that says that when people are in a room having a conversation, if there are more than seven approximately people, it will break into two conversations. OK? Um, it doesn't say that 15 people can't work together. It says that 15 people can't sit in a room and have a single conversation over time. Um, so we're good at pro solving problems within whatever silo we have, even if it's a little bit bigger than seven. But we are not good at dealing with problems that cross silos. It's just sort of our nature. And uh, I have a, a theory here. And this theory isn't actually mine. It comes from a guy named Yves Moreau uh, from Boston Consulting Group, who studied the whole area of large 
new technologies, new business opportunities, and its impact on organizational structure. And he believes that we have fundamental tension between autonomy and cooperation. And I'll, I certainly can attest to that because here's something that I have heard again and again and again. Whenever we ask our agile teams to work together on something big, they complain that they're losing their autonomy. Have you heard that? I've heard it all the time in some really successful large companies. How do we get these autonomous teams to work together? Um, it's interesting because I worked with, when I did product development at 3M, much larger teams than seven. Typically our teams were 30, 20, 30, 40 people, and we didn't have this problem, but we, then we didn't either have this idea that seven people were supposed to be completely autonomous. In fact, when you think about that word autonomy, it comes, I suppose, from uh, the popular autonomy, mastery, and purpose, which we heard about yesterday. Those are good things, and they, they motivate people. But at what level do we have that autonomy? Actually, the research is at the individual level. And when you put a person on an agile team, they actually are not autonomous anymore. Yes? They have to do whatever the agile team wants to do. And so we've chosen the level seven, plus or minus two, to be the unit that's supposed to be autonomy, at autonomous. But that's an interesting choice, not based on a whole lot of research. That's the proper autonomous unit. It could be smaller, it's often larger. Um, but what we get when we think of all of our agile teams as having to be autonomous is we get this autonomy thing having way more weight than its size. And forcing everybody to think in a certain way, which causes our need to have these many, many small teams as we grow that have to be somehow autonomous. And the idea of them cooperating across team boundaries sort of gets lost in the picture. Um, and we need to think, why do we allow that to happen? So here's the, here's the book Eve Moreau wrote, and it's called Six Simple Rules, and it has to do with scaling and complexity. He also has a wonderful TED Talk. So just to get introduced to his, his ideas, I suggest you just go find Six Simple Rules uh, by Eve Moreau and his, uh, I'm not sure I'm saying his name quite right because I know do real well in French, but I think I'm close. Um, and so the thing is that getting teams to work is a challenge, but getting teams to work together is an even bigger challenge. And when you scale, you have to work on the second part of this. How do we get teams to work together? And it's a concept of how do we balance autonomy and cooperation? Because one of them can't be so heavy that it wins out all of the time. Let's look at the science of cooperation. Uh, once upon a time, actually it wasn't that long ago, maybe the, uh, um, I think it was, the uh, 80s, mid 80s, we had this concept of the theory of the, the tragedy of the commons. Have you ever heard of the tragedy of the commons? So what it is, is we have this beautiful park or pasture land or whatever, and it's open to everybody to use, and it gets overused. Way too many people come and use it, and it turns into a wasteland. And that's the tragedy of it comes. If we allow everybody to go ahead and use that, they're going to use it up. Because we don't have any rules, any central governing authority, so how can we keep it from being used up? Because, the theory went, everybody is selfish, and they're gonna want what's good for themselves, forget the rest of the, organ, of the commons. And there was an economist who didn't like this idea, um, and several of them started doing research on are there common areas where people actually cooperate effectively over time? Here, for example, is a study of the um, irrigation commons in India. Hundreds of years of successful community work without any central governing authority. And um, Eleanor Ostrom uh, won a Nobel Prize for her work in studying common areas that had successful cooperation over centuries. And of course, not all common areas were successful, 
But if you think of the fishing commons in Norway, or if you think of uh, she studied irrigation in Spain and pasture lands and forests that had common use. And when they were successful for centuries at a time, she found common rules that were being used that allowed the community there to self-organize around making sure the commons were preserved over time for the long term. So the short-term thinking uh, was somehow pushed aside by a self-organizing community. And how did it work? Well, successful self-governing communities, according to Eleanor Ostrom, have a few principles in common. Number one, they are clearly defined boundaries. Think about the fishing areas in Norway, the cod up there in the Lofton Islands. So Norway's probably never going to join the EU because then their fishing areas would become common to everybody in the EU, and that's not going to happen. Because those common areas have been preserved for centuries because there are boundaries beyond which nobody gets to fish except the local people. And that's going to be preserved if those fishing areas are going to be preserved. So there are boundaries that people are not allowed to cross, except the community. There are rules of use that are well matched to the area. So these rules happen that match whatever the situation is. Um, and most of the individuals affected by the rules get a voice in making the rules. And community members set up a system for monitoring compliance. Okay, so let's say it's tight, it's the time when the fish are spawning, and so everybody's agreed that every boat will go out once a week, and you've gone out yesterday, and somebody catches you going out in your boat today. Well, anybody who sees that is likely to say, <clears throat> I saw you go out yesterday, and the rules are. And you could ignore it or pay attention. But should you ignore it, you'd be likely to find a hole in your boat tomorrow. Because there are increasing uh, sanctions depending upon how, how bad you might violate the rules. Um, but every single time self-organizing communities work, there are rules that are enforced with graduated system of sanctions. And there's a low conflict resolution mechanism. Uh, external authorities respect the right of the community to make its own rules. And as, as Norway respects the right of the local fisheries to make their own rules. And governance activities are sort of um, organized in multiple layers. They're, they're fractal. So cooperation can work. Not every community that tries them makes it. She can document plenty of places where this doesn't work. But where it has worked for a very long time, these are the things that are there. So cooperation can work. And these are good things to look at if you want to say what makes self-organization work. Um, another thing to look at, however, as I started to hint at earlier, is size. Okay, so how big of a group do you need or can you have and have people still cooperate? Um, so in the research there, the, the guy's name is Robin Dunbar, a British anthropologist who studied primates, monkeys, baboons, bonobos, yes? and other of those things. And he found that little monkeys stayed together in little tribes, and medium-sized primates stayed together in medium-sized prime uh, tribes, and big ones stayed together in big tribes. They have this grooming behavior where they groom each other, you know, and make each other feel good. And that basically is a mechanism to say, you're in our community. You're, you're in, the other guy's out. And um, they know who, who belongs because of that. And um, so he basically said, OK, now think about this. If we're primates, and if the, the smaller ones have smaller brains so they can only keep track of a few people that they monkeys that they really know, and medium size, I'll bet that the size of our brain here, the, the neocortex in front, which is the relationship piece, decides how big our tribe can be. Okay, and so he just extrapolated brain size and he said, you know what, humans ought to be able to keep track of about 150 people. 
because that's the way it goes with extrapolating out from the monkeys. Now, this is just a theory to begin with. Um, that was his theory. So that's the number of individuals who you can keep track of as part of your, your sort of social group. And um, so that's the human social capacity. So above 150, uh, you have some problems. But the other thing is he came up with other group sizes in subsequent reviews. When this was just a theory, um, lots of people went out and explored, huh, does that really work? And they did find that 150 was an interesting size. They looked at the UK and discovered that before industrialization of the UK, all the little towns and villages topped, had an average of 150 residents, except in Kent where it was 100. Don't know what it says about their brain sizes, but you know. So um, group sizes. He says there's really sort of these different kinds of group sizes. An inner circle group, family or friends that you can find in primitive times. Um, maybe three to five people. And then there's a sympathy group. People who really care about the fate of each other. Maybe seven to ten really close friends. And then there's a hunting group, you know, go kill the mammoth. And seven to 10 can't kill a mammoth. You need lots of different skills in order to be able to hunt down, down one of those things and, and, and have food. And so you form a hunting group, which is 30 to 50 colleagues who cooperate on something important. And that reminded me of our product groups at 3M. They were always in that range. And it was a hunting group size. And then there's a clan. That's the 100 to 150. So that tops out at the Dunbar number of 150. And these are people who maintain close interpersonal relationships. So um, uh, there's something in the vicinity of 150 people where you know the names of the families and the friends and the, you know, you look on Facebook and you recognize the pictures and that sort of thing. Um, and a tribe goes up by another factor of three, maybe 500 to 2,500 people who might speak the same language. So you can understand each other quite well. So taking a look at the clans, the 100 to 150 people. As I said, you find this in pre-industrial villages. Amish and Hutterite communities, religious communities, split at 150 or so because they found that beyond that, all of the uh, pre social interaction pressures that made things work evaporate. Um, military companies are about 100 to 150. And university departments tend to not be more than that. And Gore and Associates, one of the, you know Gore-Tex clothes, they've run their company this way for a very long time. As soon as a business unit gets to be about 150, what they do is they, um, they put about 150 parking spaces out there by the, you know, the building. And when people start parking on the grass, they split it in half and build another one. Now, when I worked at 3M, our divisions were actually the same, but we didn't do the grass part. We had a, a dollar revenue limit. And when the revenue limit reached a certain part, we split into another division and we had two divisions. And so when I was there, there were 40 or 50 very disparate divisions with interacting technologies underneath. And it worked very well. I see lots of problems with large organizations and I, I'm not so familiar with them because when we had, when I was in the division and I was in three, maybe four, um, I knew all of the people in the lab, lab was our development unit because we're a chemistry company. I knew all the marketing people. I knew the people in that organization except possibly the manufacturing people at a remote site. 100, maybe 200 in that vicinity of people in a division, in, in headquarters. Um, so let's take a look at this hunting group a little bit more. Because to me a hunting group is a natural product size. Um, military platoon is, um, say, three squats. And product teams, in my world of hardware and software, because I've always been in the world of hardware controlling software, maybe embedded, maybe separate, but hardware software world, you rarely find teams of seven people that can do anything. You need to have people that have hardware skills and firmware skills and software skills. And so our teams tend to be hunting group size. Um, startup companies, they, they, that's a 
uh, kind of an area where they tend to, before they go into these big silos, they can be about then. And open source projects tend to have that many active people. And the interesting thing about a hunting group is that it always has a leader. Somebody that brings everybody together and sets the overall, I mean, you have an entrepreneurial leader here at a startup company. You had what we call the product champion on our product teams. Somebody that is trusted to bring everybody together and make sure they go that direction because that's where the mammoth is. And that the people know the strategy of we're going to put the, uh, these people here in order to scare them and that trap there so that that gets organized efficiently and quickly. Um, not to tell people how to do their specialty, but just to make sure that everything's orchestrated. Sort of like a band director. When you get 30 or 40 people in a band, you need somebody that's coordinating everything that happens. They don't play instruments. They don't even tell people how to play instruments, but they coordinate. So let's take a look at the sympathy group. This is, this is the Agile team group. This is one of those groups. It's seven to 10 people. And um, this is Chris Fry. I first ran into him at um, Salesforce. Yeah, it was Salesforce. When he was starting Agile there in 2006, he moved over to Twitter and became their vice president of engineering. And so what he's done is he has scaled up two massive engineering, software engineering organizations. And he gave a very interesting talk about what it takes to scale. And he said, um, one of the most scalable organizations in human history was the Roman army. Okay. Uh, its defining unit was the squad, eight guys in a tent. They slept together, they got orders as a unit, they, um, they had somebody with a donkey to carry the stuff, number nine, and somebody to set up the tent and provide food, number ten, and they were, you know, that, that was the squad. And those formed into groups of three, and then groups of three groups of three, so that you got up to a centurion, which is a hundred. So this worked for a very long time. And actually, you'll find a very similar concept in military units today, which I'll get to. But he says, as a manager, you should fo your focus really should be on creating these high-performance squads of people who have good chemistry. So the chemistry means they stay together, who can get things done, good idea. And then you figure out how to apply them to problems. So you want to build strong teams first, because you can't scale without them and then assign them problems. You want to keep teams together, go modular. So you want to remove as many dependencies between teams as you can. And in the kinds of worlds that Chris Fry has been in, pure software, he's been pretty able to do that. Um, you hear uh, on the side big discussions about microservices, which is an underlying architecture that allows this to work. And you want to establish a short regular ship cycle. Sound familiar? So these are the, this is sort of the agile team model. But let's go to the hunting group and the clan size. So the hunting group, 40 to 50 people. This is a company in Oslo. It used to be called Tanberg, now it's Cisco. And Cisco bought them maybe because of what this interesting team did. They, um, they put this thing together. It's a Codec 90 in 20 months. Anybody here who's done hardware software with a whole bunch of embedded firmware, 20 months is really fast. And um, when we were working with Tanberg just before the Cisco acquisition, we had lots of discussions about their history and their culture and their, uh, the founder and current sort of president emeritus, I guess you would say, um, said that they found that the ideal team size is 30 to 70. Now does that sound strange, 30 to 70? Sounds strange to people who think it has to be seven, but to me, it was like, well, yeah, of course, because that's what it takes to put this product on the market that fast. Um, and they had a respected leader. In fact, he was a project manager that told us how he did it, and it was really fun because he did this um, synchronization point every about three months, and everybody got together, and he would just make sure each sync point was done on time. And he also just said that when they got to about the fourth synchronization point, um, everybody came together to, to talk, and the buzz was that their chip manufacturer had just released a new, much faster fundamental chip that they were going to use. 
And they were two thirds of the way through the development cycle and they all looked at each other and they said, we got to put that chip in. And so he said, well, you know, project managers try to get stuff done on time, but you have to also listen to reality and listen to the market. So I said to the guys, what is it going to take? And they said, they went off for a day and they all came back and said, give us two more months. And so he did. He gave them two more months to move in that new chip and they got it out to the market about six to eight months after that, which meant they put on the market something with a brand new chip less than a year after the chip was introduced and available. So they were way ahead of the curve on the speed of this thing for multiplexing large scale video, which is what the company did and which is um, now what Cisco does. So um, that's the team size that they always lived with. They didn't think about yeah, they had sub-teams, but the sub-teams were part of the big team. They weren't um, teams that were put together to work together. They were sub-teams of the team that was doing this. Now, here's another size team. If, you've ever, if you want to read a really interesting book, this Creativity, Inc. by um, Ed Catmull is all about how Pixar made hit movie after hit movie after animated hit movie, after one, after the other, after the other, for year in and year out. And one of the things he said was, it takes about 200 people to put a movie together. They work together for about two years. And everything about making a hit movie work is making sure that those 200 people, half of them techies, because remember, we're doing animation, and half of them creatives. He says it's hard enough to get the techie guys to work together and it's hard enough to get the creatives to work together, but to get them to work across, that's the real challenge. But they have to because as a group, they have to work together to put out the best movie possible. And so here we have about a little over 150 people working for two years in a pattern for 10 or 12 or 15 movies in a row putting, doing amazing work. And he said, at this, this is the key. Everybody is invested in helping the other people turn out their best work. So it's not about my team and its autonomous ability to make decisions. It's about, we want to put this great movie out and we in the technical community have to help those, those creative guys do really good creative work by giving them amazing tools and so on. So the concept when you get beyond seven-ish is you want one team, one team or one team. You can have multiple sub-teams, but you have a single shared goal, one goal. And 150 is probably enough. That's about the end of Dunbar's number. Hunting group, clan, you can't probably go much higher than that. But within those two sizes, one team, multiple sub-teams, one shared goal, and sub-teams do not succeed unless the overall goal is met of the whole team. So there's no such thing as my team did its thing. Now when we started with Agile, we said we have all of these individuals, we gotta get them into a team. And we gotta stop having partial credit. I got my coding done, I'm good. We had to have the whole team work to make sure that by the end of the iteration, everybody got tested and integrated stuff done. And a bad, you know, a smell was if I do my thing and I don't worry about everybody else. Now I propose you just have to scale that one or two more levels and say your sub teams do not succeed unless the whole team meets its higher level objective. And you have to have that concept if you expect to have cooperation across more than a small group. So you have to have this concept of shared responsibility. You have to think who's responsible for delivering value. You know, the business, right? Not us, we're in IT, so it's gotta be the business is responsible. They get to choose what they want, is that right? Or you have the product owner? How about that? Let's have the product owner be responsible. Or other teams, if we're big, but not me. <laughs> Surely not me, right? <laughs> so you need to change that. 
We work together. Nobody succeeds unless we all succeed. And you really have to make sure that people think this way. Okay? So all of us are responsible for delivering value. Everybody, not just a few people, not just that business or that product owner or whoever. So when you think about scaling and you think about the shared responsibility, I want to talk about the military model. Because as uh, Chris Fry says, this is a model that has worked for centuries, ever since the Roman army and is still in use today by most military organizations. Anybody here been in one military organization here? You tell me if I'm wrong, right? Okay. But the, form, the, the idea is that you have squads. This would be a rifle company. So you have squads, you know, like here's nine-ish people. And three squads are a platoon. So there you have 30, basically. And then three platoons plus a support unit would be a rifle company. And that's your 150. So here's your hunting group right here, your platoon. And here is your squad. And you tend to work in platoons when you're doing anything that's, you know, fairly significant. I had a friend that said that he was in um, intelligence and they would, the platoons would span out across a field. But they had to know where everybody else in their platoon was so that they didn't, you know, fire on the wrong people. And so there were two things that are key here. First of all, um, there is this concept of command intent. It's not the general tells people what to do. That kind of went out when guns came in because it became pretty clear in the late 1800s that if you had a plan of battle and you held to it for the whole battle, you were probably going to lose if your opponent could change their plans at any time. And so the idea switched to let the commander give out their intent and let the local squad leaders make their best judgment based on that intent as to how to accomplish it. Um, am I right? Those of you that have been in the military unit, more, much more like that. Not if you're in procurement, of course, but. <laughs> so command intent, a concise expression of the purpose of the campaign, what the end state ought to look like, and the expected progress of my squad towards helping that end state occur. And then you get collaborative planning, okay? So you have the squad leaders probably getting together, and they figure out who's going to do what. And then you do it. And during the action, the squads must maintain situational awareness, one level up. OK? So basically, I'm in a squad. What's my platoon doing? I'm a platoon leader. What is, uh, what is uh, going on here? So I have to understand command intent, two levels up, and maintain situational awareness, one level up. So. Um, and then, based on that, I make the best decisions as to how to proceed. You know, the, the um, classic agile approach to winning wars, on the ground anyway. Actually, in the sky, but that's another issue. Let's talk about this thing called situational awareness. Because command intent, common goal, you probably get that. But what is situational awareness? Because um, I have a friend, Robert Benefield, in, in uh, London, um, and he is very, very clear that he believes that this is the thing we lack when we're trying to work across teams. Situational awareness. You not just understand the grand total, the grand scheme, but you need to understand what the other teams are trying to do, where they're at and what's going on. So to, to, to define situational awareness, I, I kind of like this one. This is Wayne Gretzky. And this is his classic saying. I skate to where the puck is going to be, not where it has been. And that's why he's a great hockey player. Um, in fact, people say they watch him, and he doesn't actually move so much. He sort of sits by the net and is watching everything that's going on, and then suddenly he explodes, and for some reason, the puck arrives wherever he's skating to, and that's why he's a great hockey player. So situational awareness is knowing what's about to happen in time to do something about it. Paying attention to what's going on and knowing what's going to happen based on your observation of everything that's going on around you. Basically, any team sport works, the teams that work best maintain situational awareness of everything that's going on. 
And we need to create an environment where we have not just a common goal, but the teams that are working together can maintain situational awareness of what's going on. And by team, well, let's go on to that, by team. What do I mean by team? The next thing I want to talk about is mindset. And I was at FlowCon in San Francisco in, I think, June of last year. And a guy named Marty Kagan, I don't know if you know Marty Kagan, he's a really uh, important guy in product uh, area. In fact, in the Bay Area, he has advised many, many companies how, how to put their product management office together. Written a book on it called Inspired, really cool guy. And he led off with a talk which talked about the IT mindset. Um, and I like that concept because it sort of helps me think about What's going on here? The IT mindset. What is the IT mindset? Um, the thing that happened to Marty was that he worked with product companies and uh, in the Bay Area for maybe 10 or 15 years, and then suddenly he went and became a consultant, and he found himself working for companies that had these places called IT departments. You, you know those things? And suddenly, everything that he'd been talking about didn't work. And he was frustrated, and he said, this is why. Because the IT mindset is just different than the product mindset. In the IT mindset, people talk about the business. If I could count the number of times I heard the business yesterday, it would be a nice high number. And every time I hear the business, I hear we are not part of the business. I hear it. You are saying, they're over there, and we deliver. But in the product mindset, you are part of the line business, like you're putting together a music app, and you focus on the customers and the customer experience. You have project managers in, um, in this world, somebody that does what the business wants. And here you have an entrepreneurial leader, a, entrepreneurial guy that starts up a new company. In the IT mindset, you have a development team that takes orders from somebody, okay? Here, here's what you're supposed to develop. Give me an estimate. That's not what happens in a product organization. In a product organization, the software engineering team, and that's what they're called, software engineers, because they engineer solutions to problems, sit in the line business, just like all engineers in a product company sit if they're going to design, develop the product in the line business and are directly responsible to the line business to create something that really, really enchants in, in, in customers. Success over here, if you're a project manager, is cost, schedule, and scope. You've heard of those things. That's not a concept in a product company. Who cares about cost, schedule, and scope? It's not relevant. What is relevant is delighted customers. It's market share. That's what matters. And you spend the right amount of money and deploy at the right amount of time to make that happen. Um, tough trade-offs are made during the planning process, usually, in IT. And once the planning process is over, you do it. Tough trade-offs are made in a product company based on, let's find out what the market really likes, let's check out their response, and let's do something about the response to the market. Here you have a cost center mentality because IT departments are almost always cost centers. If you are associated with an IT department, are you not a cost center? And what is the common focus of a cost center? It's to drive down costs. In fact, I know of only one IT department that um, is a massive profit center instead of a cost center. Guess what it is? It's the IT department at Amazon, because Amazon actually has an IT department. That IT department makes approximately a billion dollars a quarter in revenue through the Amazon cloud services. Other than that, IT departments tend to be cost centers. Um, here's a profit center mentality. We need to reinvest our profit in making the product work. And since I spent all my life in product environments, um, I know for a fact that the nice part about being in a product market is you can spend money to make money. That's a, that's a really nice thing. Every time I get in an environment where I can't spend money to make money, I get frustrated. Um, by the way, just for your information, Scrum was designed 
for the IT mindset, for the order taking mindset. It was. Think about it. Uh, in today's world, it's 2015. Scrum is 20 years old. It was widely adopted about 15 years ago. We have gone through massive changes in technology. Those people that used to have to come to the IT departments in our businesses can now go rent whatever IT infrastructure they want. Everything about their business is becoming dependent upon having very good digital front ends. Even banks have to have apps. And um, suddenly, it's not, about, it's not about deliver us something. It's about the product mindset. It's about how do I get the right kind of stuff now fast on the market to make it work. I know for a fact that there's, t I will propose, because I've been around a long time, I believe this is true from my observation, IT departments were founded for two reasons. Number one reason, because founders and senior people in companies back in the days when IT departments were founded as part of banks and insurance companies and telecoms, the managers couldn't even type, right? They couldn't. When I was a manager in a company, I was, among my colleagues, a rare person who could type because secretaries typed. So anything that had to do with that was not something that managers wanted to deal with. That was put off in a corner and called IT. And secondly, it was expensive, and there were all these big pieces of equipment and hardware, and we didn't want to be spending our money on all sorts of different ones in all these different business units. It would cost too much. That's not true anymore. Not when the big companies in the world that are starting to have massive scale rent all of their infrastructure and don't think twice about how much it costs uh, to have different kinds of technology bases. In fact, um, I, I ran into somebody who had started up a business in the nine, late 90s and then started up a business about um, four years ago. And he said the difference between the two startups was that in the late 90s, he had to have all of his own infrastructure and servers. And now when he started up a business, he only needed 10% of the number of people in order to start up his business because all the infrastructure was rented. So the equation changes not just for startups, but for any company. What you really need is smart engineers in your line business, 10%, and rent your infrastructure. And as, it, as companies have to be on the web or in apps or in any kind of technology like wearable technology, if that's where their, comp their products need to go, they are going to have to start thinking, how do I get smart engineers in my line business that are responsive to me, and why don't I just rent my infrastructure? It's going to be as secure, no doubt, maybe not, but probably more secure than my IT infrastructure, and certainly much easier to procure on scale and that sort of thing. So um, the reasons for IT departments have largely disappeared. Managers get technology, and managers, do, and you do not need as a cost-saving measurement measure to focus and coordinate technology in a single spot, not anymore. So what we need to think about is how do we change delivery teams to problem-solving teams. We have to stop having this model. Here are some things, and I don't care if it's a project manager, if it's a business, if it's a product owner, giving a team a list of stories that are prioritized or whatever to do, and then measuring how well they do. We've got to get over that. That is not leveraging the intelligence of our smart engineers. What we need to do instead is to have problem-solving teams to whom we give serious problems and challenges and ask them to solve it, okay? Not by writing tiny little stories to design the solution for them. We need teams of the right people that can solve problems, not do delivery. And by the way, I know this is Budapest, and I know a lot of you are involved in outsourcing, but in this paradigm where I see the world going is outsourcing is on its way out. It's going to go. And this is going to take over. Because now with the infrastructure rentable 
And as you get more and more capability of just focusing on the app, and you can put it in a container, and you can deploy it anywhere, then suddenly this is what matters to line businesses, and they want way more control of it. So if you look at what do you do for governance then, here's Marty Kagan's book, Inspired. And he has this concept of product management. Um, not the same, by the way, as product owner. And um, he says that magic happens when engineers, designers, and tech-savvy product managers interact directly with customers in their native habitat. Okay? You go to the people who are going to use yours, and you watch them, you interact with them, and you make sure that you have experienced designers, tech-savvy product managers, and um, the technical development folks, the engineers. That's when you get magic. So he says that you need to make sure that what you have in a product has value. That's why the product manager's job is to make sure customers value this, they will pay for it, it's something that they're going to love. It has to be usable. This is extraordinarily important. As an equal member of the team, you must have a designer if there is any kind of user interaction involved. And it has to be technically feasible. So as an equal member of the team, you have a group of at least senior engineers involved in figuring out what you're going to do. And then when you have that, that's when you get great products. And interestingly enough, when we did product development at 3M, we had teams that had all of those people. And no one person was telling the other people what to do because they would get run out of the team room in a, in a flash if they did. So the marketing person couldn't say, we're going to do this. And the design person couldn't say, we're going to do this. And the technical person couldn't say, we're going to do this. They had to have a discussion and figure out the trade-offs and figure out how to make all of the different things hit this center right here. And that's what you want. Not any one of these areas telling the other one what to do, um, but you want to have this group, but this is probably bigger than seven people. And if it is, you probably need to have a leader that makes sure that everybody knows where to focus. And so here are some things that a product manager does not do. A product manager does not design the solution. Okay, anytime you get a list of requirements or a list of detailed stories, whoever wrote those requirements or stories designed the solution. That is solution design. Okay, and that solution design is not done by a product manager, it's done by this group of people that make the trade-offs between experience, technology, and value. They don't prioritize tasks. I tell you, if anybody on my product development teams at 3M would say, would try to come up with a list of prioritized tasks, they would be shown the door also, especially if I would try to do that as the, as the champion. Um, and they don't write stories. They don't write the detail because that's what the team does. So if you think about this concept, what you want to do is say, how do we create great products? And why is this a governance mechanism? Because you can tell if it works. Because you've got a market out there that can measure how good it is. So this term governance, it's interesting. I have never heard it in relationship to a product company. Only boards, maybe but never a line organization. Why? They're governed by the market. The reason why IT needs governance is because it doesn't have a direct feedback in market acceptance and, and revenue and stuff like that. So they need some sort of governance to make sure they make the right decisions. But when you have a product group making sure they make brilliant products, that equals governance. So another thing, last thing I want to say in this area is, Conway's law doesn't go away. So Conway's law says that you need to structure the organization to match the architecture of the system, or basically he said in 1965 in a Datamation article, um, organization, no, systems developed by organizations tend to reflect the communication structures of the organizations which design them. And so when you have stuff that's done by an organization, it's going to look like the organization that designed it. And it's reversible. If you have a big monolithic architecture, you actually have to have 
a big monolithic group of people supporting it. You do. And if you want to have teams that are, well, let's say 30 to 50, anyway, forget seven. You could do seven if you want to do microstructures, microservices. Um, if you want teams that are relatively small, you need to figure out how to create independent portions of your architecture, which are similarly small. So if you have a shared code base, if different people are going to be making changes on a code base at the same time, that's one team, period. One team if you have a shared code base. If your teams are too big, you need to break dependency so it works. Now, sometimes the, the code base is separate, but it still has to integrate into a bigger system. I mean, we have a database and everybody has to share that. So we have to integrate into a bigger system. And if you have a bigger system that everybody is going to have to do a shared system test around, that's one group. That's probably no more than 150 people. And if it's bigger, you need to figure out how to change your underlying system architecture so that it's a single group of a reasonable size, maybe a Dunbar number size, that can share that system integration. So this is a challenge because it's an organizational challenge. It's not just an architecture challenge. And anybody doing any kind of serious software architecture on large scale systems has got to be engaged in also doing serious organizational structure, uh, solving organizational structure problems at the same time or it won't work. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is focus and um, focus. So if it's good, if, if Agile is good, scaled Agile is better, right? I've heard it. People think so. So sometimes I hear people not saying, how do we scale, but how do we scale Agile? And I haven't been talking about how we scale Agile, have I? I've been talking about how we scale to larger size teams and groups. And there's a reason for that. Because when people say, um, how do we scale Agile, here's the questions I get. How do we convince executives to invest in Agile? How do we ensure teams work on the right stuff? How does Agile work with big legacy code bases? How do waterfall and Agile teams work together? What's the role of managers? And it goes on and on. That is, how do we scale Agile? Why do you want to scale Agile? Why would you want to scale Agile? That's the wrong question, because there's nothing inherently good about Agile. And there's nothing inherently good about scaling Agile. And if you measure how good you can scale Agile, you have measured nothing. You need to measure, have I done something useful for the business environment that I'm sitting in? And if it means having Agile teams that work on a bigger scale, that's fine. But the objective is not to scale Agile. The objective is to have better business success in a larger environment. So you have to think about what are the right questions. And when you focus on mechanisms and methods and tools of scaling Agile, your focus is wrong. You just basically have the wrong focus. So quit asking that question. Quit worrying about how to scale Agile and try to figure out how do we get a lot of stuff done. I propose you think more about business impact. So if you think about business impact, um, I wanted to go to a few kind of giants in this area um, and talk about what I'm going to call impact-driven development. And the very first thing there is the concept of starting with why. Because when you start with why, Tom, the author? Simon Simic. Simic. Uh, nice book and also a nice TED talk by Simon Simic that many of you might have seen. But when you start with uh, a new effort, of any type. The first question is, what's the problem? What's the purpose? Why are we doing this? Because purpose is one of the main, you know, economy, mastery, purpose. We can't just say autonomy is the only thing. We've got to say purpose. So why are we doing this? And then there's a couple more giants, actually Tom, and his, that's his son, um, Kai, who now works with him. And um, Tom wrote the first uh, ACM article on incremental delivery in 1983. 
as in, this incremental stuff is not new. Um, and he's been preaching it ever since. And when Agile came along, he was excited about it for a while. And then he became quite disillusioned. And he calls the, the, the first 2000 to 2010 the lost decade of Agile. Because um, what he has always advocated is that when you have anything you want to do, the first thing you got to figure out is, how do I measure what good is? How do I know what success is? And so you want to figure out who are your stakeholders? Who cares about the impact? Is it customers? Is it a business person? And there will be several stakeholders. Who are they? And how are they going to measure whether or not what you did is good? And that's all you need to know. You don't really need to know what they want you to do. Um, I can relate to that because, as I said, I did, I did hardware software systems. The systems I programmed the most were process control systems, which controlled great big 3M roll good processes. And we knew our date that we had to deliver it by, and we knew the, that was about it. And nobody told us how to design a process control system. We were the engineers. We knew what a process control system did. I worked for senior engineers that had been designing process control systems with wires and components for about two or three decades. So nobody told us how to develop a process control system. They said, Oklahoma City, start up in a year and a half. OK, and there's where the process is being designed upstairs. And that was it. So the idea is, how are you going to have the outcome measured? For us, it was on time, and I had to make good product, and a few other things like that. And other than that, we weren't told anything, because we were engineers, and we were expected to solve the problem. That's what we did. The next thing you want to do is design pieces of the system and create a hypothesis of the impact of those designs. So this concept of hypothesis of impact, again, it's not new. Tom has been proposing this for a good long time. And what changes are going to create the outcomes that move your measurements in the right direction? And which ones? How much do you expect to move them? And then we move to the lean startup concept that says, prove the impact is being achieved. We had a hypothesis that these uh, designs would work. So what percentage of our measurable impact are we getting? And of course, to do this, you have to have incremental delivery. Um, and you experiment, you prototype, you implement the change permanently if it actually works. And then you go on until you have something that achieves the impact. This, according to Tom Gilb, is real software development the way it ought to be done and should ought to have been done for the last 30 or so years. Um, and I kind of agree with him. When I was doing software, we more or less worked like this. Now, if that's true, and we're not trying to scale Agile, but Agile has lots of good ideas, how might it work? I'm going to tell you the story of Oh my gosh, a government. Can you imagine? You know those people that don't get the idea of you spend money to make money? Um, so I didn't believe it myself when I first saw it. Um, but every government everywhere has these stories. Like the British National Health Service spent over nine years about 10 billion pounds. That's a lot of money. And then dumped the system. But you've heard that story way too many times, yes? That's not, a new, that's not a new story. We have our own in the US. It's called the healthcare.gov disaster, and so on. So every, everybody had, and then there's our FBI case management system disaster. And so this is not new. This is something that we've heard again and again and again. But somebody, actually a conservative MP at the British government said, this has got to stop. You'd think today we could do better than this. Similarly, um, that's happening in our company, country. But, um, what they found out, and what we had known for a while, is that there is this little tiny country called Estonia that automated their government systems from the day they decided to have a government in the mid-90s. And um, they said, you know, we're a poor little country, we don't have much money, so the only way we can afford to have good systems is we need to figure out how to automate now. And they created an environment first with a universal identifier, and then with the ability to using that to have people do any government interaction from getting a marriage license to finding your kids' grades to you know, getting health care to voting, you name it. And then that identifier became usable with banks and with transit companies. And it's a pretty amazing place I, to be in. I had a class 
in Tallinn, in which um, five of the people there had been behind some of the design of that system. It was, they were just amazing. Um, the, the most enthusiastic government workers I have ever had the pleasure to run into, by the way. Um, and so anyway, uh, the British guy went over to Estonia and says, how do you do this? Well, Estonia is more than willing to tell anybody that comes. And the, he, took, he took them seriously. And he went back to the UK and he started something called um, UK.gov. And the way it works is, well, let's automate our big government infrastructure. How do we do that? Well, the first thing is we can't go out for bids on contracts because the government laws require us to do bids, so we're going to have to hire people. Okay, let's face it, we're going to have to hire some people so, um, because then we can do whatever we want, right? <laughs> and then here's the way they do things. They put together a team. Who's on this team? The first lead person on the team is a designer. Why? Because it's a user interaction, basically. Why wouldn't a designer be the lead? Now, if I were doing an engineering system, I would want the technical lead to be the lead. But this is an interaction system, so I want a designer to be the lead. And the designer and the group spend time studying the problem, and then after, a less, after two months or less, they put together an alpha, maybe take a month or six weeks, and then they start gradually rolling that out to small numbers of people, making changes for as long as it takes until suddenly, you know, some people can get a marriage license. And then they roll it out to everybody and they go green and they go find another thing to do. They've hired more people. I think the last I heard it was a couple hundred and fifty. Um, it's not perfect, nothing ever is, but it's working pretty amazingly well. They have, um, here you can get some more um, information about their governance. They have a delivery team which has a charter. The charter is a service vision, and you know, let's automate the, let's make it much easier to get a marriage license or to, to pay taxes or whatever. Um, they have quantifiable goals. What are the impacts of what you're supposed to do? How many, what percentage of the population in this area is going to be getting uh, marriage licenses online, and what amount of time is it going to save them, and how much money is it going to save us? Um, key performance indicators to show that they're going to meet these things. And the governance principles are interesting. <coughs> Don't slow down delivery. Decisions should be made when they're needed at the right level by the people who supposedly know the most. Do it with the right people. You can't do this with just anybody. You do have to have good, competent technical teams. You have to have people that are really good designers. In fact, they won some design awards and so on. And if you're a manager and worrying about what's going on, then go to the team room and look at the walls. Don't expect status reports. And only do it if it adds value. So, uh, and then trust and verify. So, this group now has formed UK and several other governments, a government automation group. They are beginning to have conferences every year and all that kind of stuff, maybe every six months. And around the world, governments are getting together and saying, ah, this might not be such a bad idea. So, this isn't scaled agile. Okay. This is taking agile ideas and principles and saying, what problem are we trying to solve? And what is the best way to solve that problem in our context? And that's the way you have to approach scaling agile. But by, by a few years from now, the UK government will be an online government. And they will not have spent 10 more years and another 10 billion pounds trying to get there, only to find out that nothing works. And the last thing I want to talk about is complexity. So, because when you get big, you get complex. In fact, it's the one constant in our profession or our, our, the stuff that we do. What we do is deeply complex. There is no getting around it. There never will be any getting around it. And we should basically, I believe, bite that bullet and figure out what we got to do about the fact that what we do is complex. Now there are some laws of complexity that we tend to have ignored for the last, I don't know, three or four decades. 
And here's the big one. One thing we know for sure about complex systems is we know what doesn't work. This. When you smash a complex system, all bets are off on how it's going to respond. Everybody knows that. That's sort of like the law of queuing theory, law of physics, law of math. This is, this is the way the world works. So if you have a big complex system and you smash it every six months or whatever, all bets are off. You have no idea how it's going to respond. It will not be stable. That you can guarantee. And yet, we've been telling people for I don't know how many years, if we get everything together and everything in a big package and try to put it in all completely tested, it's going to be so well tested, it will work. Wrong. OK, we know that. We've learned that. This Big Bang thing is really stupid. We have to get over it. So how do you change a big system, if you're going to have a big system? How do you change it? Here's what works. Right? OK? Everybody that works with complex systems knows. I did, I did systems that controlled big roll goods processes. And if I wasn't quite sure about the set point, I would just change the dial a little bit. Because if I change it a lot, I'd get oscillations. Just a little tiny thing and see how it responded. And I didn't get in there until it zeroed in on the right thing. And that's what you do with complex systems. You poke it. And you see the response. And then you react to it. That's the laws of complex system. Now, the question is, how do our processes and technical approaches and architectures support this? Because for a long time, they haven't. That's why I believe that the, the software engineering of the future has to be something along the lines of continuous delivery. As hard as it feels to you, it's not actually optional if you want to survive. Because if you're dealing with a complex system, you have to figure out how to poke it, not smash it. And this is the best thing so far that I've seen that does a really good job of poking systems. There are other ways, because I've seen other architectures. But if you have a monolithic architecture, I don't see many options. And the other thing is, from the time this book came out in 2010, every time we go places, we run into people who have done this. Totally unexpected groups. We were in Lithuania, and uh, a, a group there had started up a, um, a website that did loans on credit cards. Loan sharks, yeah? And this was 2011 or 12, one of those. And they were already doing continuous delivery. Well, almost. They were within uh, one, one area. It took a week to deliver. Otherwise, it was delivered every day. And no matter where we go, we come into companies that have figured out how to make this work. Not that it's easy, and usually it takes a good year for people to get all the underlying thing. And by the way, the biggest problem is the organizational problem and the will to do it. And once those are solved, the technology takes about a year to bang out. Um, so it's acceptance test-driven development. You say what you're trying to achieve, and then make sure you do. It's tight collaboration between business and delivery teams, as if they're one team. Good idea. Um, Cross-functional teams must include ops. Yeah, of course QA. That's not new. But ops has to be on the team. There's really no option. Um, you have to have automated build, lots of automation. Build, testing, database migration, and deployment. All have to be automated. You have to have internal incremental development on the main line with continuous integration. You know what this means? What Jess Humble says is, if everybody isn't committing code at least once a day with tests, validation tests, to the main line, to the trunk, then it's not continuous delivery. No branches, one trunk. Amazing concept. But when you get there, when you reduce from 30 branches to 10 branches to two and then to one, things actually go a whole lot better, as hard as it feels like to get there. Software is always production ready, and teams prioritize keeping it production ready over any feature delivery. Amazing. And um, releases are basically done by switch. So deployment and release are two separate concepts. 
I deploy the software all the time, but it doesn't necessarily turn it on. I turn it on with a logical switch until it's running all the time, and I might remove the switch. So I have fine-grained control of my software, and when it becomes exposed, which really helps me with incremental, like canary releasing and trying it on just a few percentage of customers and things like that. So continuous delivery, I think, is not an option. Um, but the first thing, I, last thing I'm going to do is tell you about another company I know of that um, did this. And the reason I'm talking about this one this is a financial company. This company is called SA Home Loan, and it's in Durban, South Africa. Little, like, small town. And they were in Cape Town at one of our workshops. And it was similar to the workshop we did Monday where people did value stream apps, about five different teams, and they got up at the end and they did theirs. And they showed a value stream map from the time they decided to do something till the time it was deployed was that next, that evening. And, and in a, everybody in the room was either financial or insurance industry, mostly senior like managers or even a CIO. And they didn't believe them. They said, you're in a financial market. How can you possibly be doing this? And they said, well, back in 2010 when this book came out, we didn't have much of any resources here, so we just got our hands on everything we could read. We decided we were going to do it. One of the people there, by the way, was a very sophisticated architect. I was really impressed with him. Very deeply competent technical guy that was one of the two leaders of this. They decided that they were going to take their team, the fairly sizable team of a few hundred people, and put them into teams where every team could do full stack. So they said we had our legacy guys and our new age guys all on the same team. And every team could do full stack. And they told everybody, we're going to do this. We're going to put you in full stack teams so every team can do its own thing all the way through to deploy. And if you don't like it, you know, you, you get to find another job. And I didn't, they didn't say if they lost anybody or not. And by the way, it took them three years to get to the point where they thought they were doing really decent continuous delivery and had broken their processes down and figured out how to make it work and be safe. Um, they got a lot of questions from the other folks in the workshop. One of them said, um, uh, one of them said, uh, what do you do about, you know, defects? And, you know, the guy said, defects. You know, we don't have defects. We might have a spec problem, but we don't have defects. It's not a concept because the specs are always automatically checked before deployment. And I said, you know, it's my experience that once you get a really good continuous delivery thing going, the developers love it. And they said, yeah, the developers love it. I said, you know, I'll bet you there's not anybody else in Durban that's doing continuous delivery. And they said, you would be right. And so I said, uh, so I bet you don't have a whole lot of trouble losing good people. And they said, well, as a matter of fact, we have had zero turnover in three years except to immigration because there's no other option. It's just such a nice environment for their developers. So um, this can be done and it's not easy and it requires very good people and good technology. But the things that you need to focus on for scale, I propose, are architecture, engineering, your organizational structure, and resilience of your system rather than a perfect system a resilient system. Um, and that's about all I have time for now. This kind of leads into a whole other talk, but that's another day. Thank you very much. So am I supposed to do questions now? Looks like. There's some microphones around if you'd like to ask. A, you, you can give me a hard time. That's OK. I, I meant to be controversial. That was my plan. I promised you, yes? So go ahead. Tell me I'm crazy. <laughs> uh, so you said earlier that the product manager doesn't prioritize tasks. Right. Uh, so who does then? OK. Let's just go to a particular slide. So you remember this one. Let's go over to this side. Here's a product manager with a prioritized set of tests that they're giving up. Here is um, 
a team that's expected to solve problems. I was at a company in Norway where they did, um, uh, they did uh, a web-based thing that's equivalent to want ads. Very successful. The only thing that's competed with eBay. And they had a product uh, manager that was saying to me, um, so what I do is I meet, say, holiday season is coming, so I meet with my team in like August or September. And I tell them, you know, here are the, the, the five or ten things that I think would be cool by Christmas time. And they would give me, a, well, there's a little bit of this and maybe not that, and this is totally impractical, but we surely could do some, several of those. And that's what they would have as their discussion. And then she put up a monitor. And the monitor basically showed the key metrics that they knew were the right things. What they were looking for was conversion from free to pay, okay? And they could see every day, all along the day, whether or not people would convert from free to pay. And given that occasional meeting with some high level wish list from the product manager, the team understood the key problems they needed to solve and figured out what are we going to do and how are we gonna attack them. They looked at what the results were on the monitor and yes, they met with and talked with the product manager, but the product manager spent her time worrying about how the market behaved and what would be cool and communicating interesting ideas to the team who then said, let's see, what makes sense, what would be good, what do we think is gonna drive this, running experiments, deciding themselves what to do next. And to me, if you have an engineering team, you do not say this task first and that task next and this story next, that's just an insult. If I had had somebody doing that to me, when I was designing the software systems I designed, I would have found another job because that's insulting. Uh, I have a question to, which relates to the beginning of your talk and yeah. it was about the tragedy of the comments. Oh yeah. And I was wondering if there ever has been the culture being part of looking at that problem because I can't imagine that the tragedy of the comments will become true, for example, in a Swiss culture. Aha. And, and that's just, and, and I, I, I really have an idea what, what it relates was investigating. Uh -huh. And if you look at her work, she was going around, especially any place in European or South American communities where, it, where the community had a long-term perspective on common areas. That's what you're looking for. And she found a bunch of them and then she found some failures. And so that's the kinds of communities she studied and I think you can read lots, of, and there's been subsequent studies, and those people that were able to take a long-term perspective on common areas without some government enforcing rules where they existed, she documented those particular the characteristics of the, those communities. And yes, there are a lot, and I'm sure there are more in Europe, and I bet Switzerland has plenty of them. If you take any country that basically historically has a long-term perspective, then you're gonna find a lot more of them. And cultures are different in their perspectives on long and short term. I come from a, one of the shortest term countries in the world. Honest. Yeah. So, so. Ah, just like Norway. Right. So, uh, you be, you said you believe that. Oh, I'm here. I'm here. Ah, okay. So, so you said you believe that outsourcing is over because because technical. Well, it's not totally over, but it's on its way down. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. It's on its way down. Uh huh. So. And you, the reason I'm saying this because I used to hear everybody say how extraordinary large pressure they had to outsource to save money. I haven't heard that in about 18 months. So do you believe that uh, most of the IG, IT jobs would go back to America? I mean, development and stuff? I believe that uh, countries everywhere, and including here in Hungary, that are smart, will hire smart software engineers into the line organization to do cool stuff. And I also believe that every single country, including Hungary, that depends on outsourcing is going to rapidly find they need those smart people here to do software for Hungary and forget about the rest of the world. Use outsourcing to learn how to do good stuff and then use it to make your country better. Okay. Thanks.
Um, so I just want to say, um, on top of that question, um, what I'm seeing from my experience is that uh, companies um, look for the mindset when hiring people, while outsourcing companies, they look for the skills that they need to serve these companies, and that is what is creating the problem. Uh, the, the core companies, so I'm, I, I work for Hotels.com, we're based in London, but we have outsourcing teams here, and one of my biggest struggles is the, the, the fact that the outsourcing companies are hiring for skills, and it's very different, the, difficult to educate them in the mindset, and they have to be okay. to drive change. But I think that the companies that are going to continually depend on that approach are going to become less and less competitive. What is true is there is a massive worldwide shortage of talent in our field, and it's not going to go away. And so com com companies have to go to different physical locations in different countries to find talented people, no question. But the smart ones create branches of that company and treat the people there as they're uh, just a part of the same company, just equal part of the other people, but a different pool of talent because we can't have enough people in our country. I was in uh, Tallinn doing one of the workshops and there was a gaming company there from, what's that other city in, in Estonia? Um, it starts with a T and it's about 200 kilometers from, what? No, it starts with T. Well, hmm? Well, anyway, um, they were from that. And they, um, they figured out how to create a gambling cap capability that got around the laws against gambling and credit card stuff in, in most countries. And so they created a very successful gaming company, but they ran out of people because it was a little city and they only could have hire so many good software engineers. So what they did was they hired um, 60 people, I don't know, in Israel, and 60 people here, and 60 people there. And each group of 60 people got a game area to develop on their own. And then they provided the core that got the games, the betting part, so that it was legal in the countries. And any time they wanted to expand, they just went to another country and established another piece of their company that totally owned another set of games. And it's that strategy of go somewhere and where there's talent, because you don't have enough folks, and, ah, tar Tartu. How do you say that? Oh, I have no idea. But that's right, Tartu. <laughs> that's where they were from. And there's only so many developers there. So the companies that are smart will form branches of their company and give whole problems to that branch and let them figure it out because they want good engineers. Now, then you definitely hire for talent. You hire for talent because you want people to be able to do good games and you're not going to be able to, from Estonia, to tell the folks in whatever other country how to do a good game. They have to figure that out for themselves. So the smart companies, I see that happening more and more. They definitely establish locations in lots of other countries where they perceive they can get good people. Um, but what they don't do is say, uh, you're a delivery organization, we're going to tell you what to do. Some, uh, there's plenty of companies that still do that. I'm not saying it's gone, I'm saying it's on the way out. Oh, and one of the things that's causing that again is, remember when you can rent your infrastructure, and when you have all of those tools provided by the cloud, you just don't need anywhere as near as many people to do stuff. And only the, you know, the good engineers that can understand how to solve the problems. So if all you need is 10 or 15 or 20 percent of the number of people, then you want those people to be the ones that can really understand how to solve your problem. And that's where the jobs are going to go. People who can solve, understand and solve problems. And understand how to build on a very complex underlying technical architecture. Understand how you can possibly do safe continuous delivery. That's a deeply technical problem. You don't do that casually. So there's lots of stuff that needs to be done in this area. Huge amounts of work. But the kind of work that is going to be coming your direction is much more like that. So, uh, I have a question to your slide number 26. 26, huh? <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, which is 26? This one. Is that it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, did uh, I understood? His mic is none. Uh, what? Could you turn your mic on? 
It's on. I don't I hear it. Close to your mouth, okay? Uh, okay. Oh, that's better. Thank you. Better. Uh, so, uh, did I understand uh, good that you uh, said that uh, QA, inclusive uh, validation, is the job of the team? Yes. Okay. And uh, what about uh, the safety relevant uh, branches as railway or flight, etc., where uh, it's uh, uh, mm, standard requirement that validator mustn't have the same boss as the developer. Well, so, that's, and, that's and easy enough to do. Boss and team are different. You can have boss and team be different. I mean, th what you do in, a, in an automated environment where you have configuration management system is that they who design the tests and write them. Maybe they report to somebody different, but they're working in detail with the development team. In fact, they write the test first. They check it in with their password, so it's they who do it. The developers can't do it. The developers write the code to pass the check test. They check it in with their password. So you can prove by your configuration management system that you have two different <laughs> functions completely separate. One does the test is, one does the development work, and I've presented this to many places that have various types of um, regulatory thing. And this is the thing the regulators love, because they can prove that the testing was done by some totally different kind of thinking process, the testers, than the developers. That doesn't mean they can't sit next to each other and work together. They can't, doesn't mean they can't talk to each other. It means. As a tester, I am, my job is to make sure I think of all of the ways that this system could harm people and make sure those are automated so it never breaks. And as a developer, it's my job to write the code, and I might not think of that stuff. And as a pair, we make sure we have a sound system. So I don't see any, any way, and I've seen plenty of highly regulated organizations, including medical devices, doing this kind of stuff. It, it, you can, you, you have to read the, regu you have to follow the intent, you definitely have to have two minds, maybe even two bosses, but that doesn't mean they don't work together on the same team. One last one, I suppose. Hi, I work for a really large organization, and all the questions I came armed with are on your slide of the wrong questions to ask. They're the wrong questions yeah. to ask. Yeah. So what advice would you give to me? What is the first thing you would do if you were entering a large organization just starting on this journey? What would be the first thing you would do? OK. Why are you starting on the journey? Um, because the traditional way of working doesn't work anymore. OK. So how would you know what's working? How are you going to tell whether anything else works? What are you going to measure? I guess how much money we make and how we okay. impact the customer, which is... Okay. Yep. So if I were you, I would start out by quantifying exactly what better is mm -hmm. and then proving you can be better. Okay. That's what I would do because those questions will fall out of the fact that I have a proposal, a hypothesis, thing you want to test that I believe is going to drive those metrics in the right direction. You don't have to convince a senior manager who wants less cost or faster turnaround or something like that, that when they get it, it's good. If you answer those questions as, well, we got 50 Agile teams now, who cares? So you need to be driving your transition from metrics that the people who are going to sponsor it really care about. And then, you know, you almost have and, and if you can drive those metrics, you kind of have a point. You, you can start generating enough revenue to keep things going. Okay. Thank you. Okay. okay so thank you for your presentation. I think it's time for break now. Yes, I do too. Thank you. <laughs>